Philippians. Now, having said that, would you stand one more time with me as we read the book of Philippians? If you are able to, Philippians chapter 2, standing together for just a moment as we read the next section of Scripture that we're going to study today. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out, as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Father, as we examine Scripture, I'm grateful for the music we've been able to sing, the truth behind it, and Lord, how healing and how helpful it is to us to lift our voices to you in worship. I know it encourages me to be reminded of how great you are, and Lord, how needful we have to know how great you are. Father, as we examine your scripture today, Lord, give me wisdom, fill me with your spirit. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here or watching online that is not 100% sure that heaven is their home, that today would be the day they would get saved. I pray for others, Lord, that are coming, that are carrying burdens that we may have no idea of. Maybe today, Father, you would use your word to encourage them and point them to you. I pray you bless. May you be honored and glorified. May you draw people to you as we lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Years ago, when I was working, I was a teenager, and one summer, my dad sent me back to a camp. We had moved from Michigan to Pennsylvania. Um, the move for me wasn't easy. It was a hard transition. So my dad decided to get me out of Pennsylvania, and he sent me to this camp that I grew up in. We moved to Michigan. There was a camp a couple hours north of us that uh, my dad's uncle was a director of. So we kind of had our own huge background, our back, backyard there. So one summer, I went back up and worked as a junior counselor. And um, now, if you ever notice this, when you get a young guys around young guys, they're not always good influences, and they're not always smart. And I'll never forget one night, um, it was our third week into the summer, and in this summer, they, would, they had this huge field that's about a half, aisle down, half a mile down some hills and down a path to an opening where the lake was, where the ball field was, the main campground was at a different area, and each cabin had two counselors, and so they would take one counselor, and we thought this would be fun when the girls would walk back through the woods when there's no lights, we'd jump out and scare them, you know, because that's smart and fun and not dangerous at all, right? None of the guys thought about the little girls walking through that. They were going to be traumatized for life because we're guys. We don't think of that stuff, right? Now, the one thing that I think is funny in this particular position, this is the third week we had done this. And my 16-year-old brain started thinking, they're going to know we're coming. But that didn't change the older guys. They were convinced, we'll just move to a different part of the woods. Right? Women, we underestimate you. I'm sorry, okay? And this was bad. So we go out there. Now, the one benefit was it was dark. And I'm talking pitch black, no lights, half-mile walk through the woods. Now, one of the things that was true about this camp was apparently about a mile past the property, there was a juvenile hall. And so we always, I, this is kind of a strange thing to have back to back, right? So every once in a while, we would tell stories of people breaking away from the jail. In today's day and age, I don't think we'd get away with this. But back then, they thought it was fun. Between that and the bears, that's what we told the kids. So we come out, and so it was my job as the 16-year-old kid to shake the branches in the woods to scare them, right? Because the bear coming through. It's pitch black. You couldn't see anything. And this was back in the day before the invention of the LED flashlight, you know, that two-inch flashlight that blinds you. Back then, if you had a real flashlight, you had a mag light. What am I, how many know what I'm talking about? All right? This thing's about three feet long. Okay, probably a foot, but that's beside the point. Made of cast iron steel. At least it felt like it. Weighed about 30 pounds. I'm exaggerating, but you know what I'm talking about. This was a weapon. And you click that thing on, it only, the light only went about three feet. But boy, you look cool carrying that thing, right? It's amazing how that little LED, how our phones do better than those lights did back in those days. But I'll never forget, as we're shaking, shaking the woods, I heard, shaking the branch, I heard a girl say, here they come. And I wasn't able to warn 
my would-be friend, and you'll know why I say would-be in a moment, that they knew we were coming. She was so angry. He was jumping out. The reason he was going, because this was his girlfriend, the girl he wanted to marry. Believe it or not, at the end of the story, they did get married down the road. This didn't help it, though. He comes jumping out. He's like, ah! He's got this crazy monkey mask on and everything. Raw! And she grabs her mag light, Wah! and right upside the head. He hits the ground. And I'm in the back like, whoa! And I'm like walking through the woods home. I'm like, they're come armed. We're in trouble. We couldn't hide. He's laying there, ah! Oh! And they went and got the nurse. He's bleeding. They thought he would get a concussion. He didn't get a concussion. And the funny part I learned earlier was she warned him not to do that this night. That's how dumb we are. Don't do this. We'll just move down. They won't know. You know, like three feet further in the woods is smarter. Women, I'm sorry. We're just not that smart. It's just the way it is. I apologize. And we thought the shroud of darkness solved the problem, right? If you think I'm exaggerating this story, I unfortunately am not. All right? That's how it went. Needless to say, it got back to the nurse and back to the director, and we were told never to do it again, which I think was smart since he had a headache for the rest of the week and made us do the rest of the work. In darkness, sometimes we see things that aren't there. Sometimes we believe things that aren't there. Or we can be convinced. In Scripture, you're going to hear a lot about the idea of light in darkness. Remember what Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And he says, we are too. But we're not the light of the world. We are Jesus as ambassador that's shining forth his light. But the depiction of light and darkness is figurative. Darkness is a light or a life without Jesus. It's trying to navigate life with, we use it as a flashlight picture, but it's without Jesus because he's the light. Light is this truth that exposes it exposes the lies. As a matter of fact, John 3, men love darkness better than light because their deeds are evil. And when we speak truth, we open up, we bring light to the false narrative of the day. Now, by the way, this was as true in Paul's day when he was in prison in Rome as it is in 2023. We look today at the news and we say, boy, we're worse than ever. We're not. You ever watched the movie Revolution? I think in the 60s, everybody thought every, we're, we're dead, right? We're going downhill. The world, it's just, it's just ebb and flow. This is not abnormal. Jesus said it would happen. But you know what he did is he placed us in the world as light bearers. He placed us as be the one to shed the light of Jesus on the world. Now, let me tell you what, we'll talk about what I mean by this. And we said this a little bit in our men's class earlier this morning. This is not me shedding what I want. This is me Letting Jesus flow through me to our world, in our families, in our church, in our community, that they see light, they see Jesus. We're not arguing my truth and their truth. There is only one truth. Uh, we are pointing people to that truth. And please understand, not so that we can prove them wrong and we are right. If that's what you're trying to do, you've got the wrong perspective. We're just trying to help them see the truth that is Jesus. Jesus will take care of that. The world wants us to fight over the things we disagree. And Jesus says, just let them see the truth. Leave it there. So what do we do to show that light? And really, a lot of what we're going to see in the passages are things we can do to halt that light. So in the net, with three thoughts today, and really, hopefully, the premise we see is this. Are we, the question is, are we developing all that Christ desires us to be for our families, for our church, our culture? The more we develop in Christ, the brighter our light. Are we doing that? Three things are necessary to see that. Number one, we need to develop what God has given us. We need to develop what God has given us. Verse 12 again. Paul said, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, catch this. He brags on this church. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He's bragging on a church that wants to serve God and doesn't need to be pushed by someone else. Here's what he says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring or complaining and disputing. Can I give you a few thoughts here? He starts off with how do we develop what's in us? Number one, understand the process. He says, work out your own salvation. What does this mean? 
Now, a lot of people, and by the way, I've read a bunch of commentaries this week, and depending on your position of this, you'll interpret interpret separately. Some believe this. Some believe that what we're supposed to do here is work to gain our salvation. But I want you to catch the wording. He says, work out your own salvation. One, he says, work out your salvation. He did not say work for your salvation. Then he says, work out your own salvation. It's something you already have. Here's what he's saying. God gives me salvation. Now I can develop from it what's inside. Let me explain what this means, okay? When you get saved, we call this, there's different doctrinal terms I'm going to share with you. The first one's what we call justification. As a sinner, we deserve to go to hell. All of us do, all right? Everybody in the world, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We deserve hell. When we come to Jesus, the Bible says we're condemned at death. When we come to Jesus, we are justified. I love the idea of justification. Can I just take a second? I wasn't going to do this, but I love this illustration. You know what justification is? It's not God's mercy. It's God's grace. You see, mercy would be God the judge in the courtroom of heaven or in a court. Let's just do a courthouse today. Someone is in jail, on trial for theft or murder, whatever it is. Mercy would be the judge saying, we're not going to put you in jail, you can go. It's not justice, but it's mercy. But that's not what God offers. God offers grace. You know what he does? You know what the picture is? The picture is just the sin still needs to be paid for. The picture of justification is God getting off of the, from the um, judge's table. He comes down and he takes the place. The judge going to jail for the place of the murderer. That's justification. We've been justified not because of what we've done. And literally, we, it's if we've never committed the crime. When that happens, when we get saved and we are justified, God gives us everything we need to live for him. Now, some of it has not been developed yet. We've been given all of the Holy Spirit we need. We've been given all of the gifts we need. We've been given all of the grace of God we need to move. Now, some of it when you're young is not developed. So we add to your faith, Peter tells us, add to your faith virtue. Virtue now is now is temperance. But we're adding what God has already put in us. You've been given everything you need. You just need to work it out. You need to literally means to develop it. You're already in possession of this. Here's the premise. Have you ever gone to the gym to work out? I, I, I used to go quite a bit. Hopefully I'll go back again. We always say that, right? But at some point, I'll get back to it. Uh, my son goes, and he knows what he's doing in the gym, all right? He knows all the machines. I walk in, and I hate it because half those machines, I have no idea what's going on, right? I'll never forget a comedian said this once when he went to the gym, and I, I thought this was hilarious. I, 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 re- I resemble this. He, he walks, he goes, I walk into a gym. They were doing some construction. I'm trying to figure out what these machines are doing because I finally climbed into one, and I'm just pulling at things to make it work. And finally, some guy goes over and says, sir, get out of the scaffolding, all right? <laughs> he said, I look for a personal trainer. This guy comes over. He's got muscles everywhere. You know the kind of thing where they can't walk right, all right? He said he's got his hair up in a button because I'm not sure if he did his hair that way or he's doing squat thrust wrong, and he built a muscle in the wrong place, either one of those. He said, but you walk in. And you'd see. Now, let me tell you, you know what's amazing to me when I go to those places is those guys who can lift all that weight that make people like me look horrible. They're the nicest people in the world because they have nothing to prove, right? (laughs) They really are. But you know when you go in, those guys don't look like that when they get there. Those guys and girls who go in and they put all the effort into exercise, they don't look that way. They have the muscle in them. What are they doing? They're developing it. They're working it out. It's literally the exact same thing. God has placed in us everything we need through the Holy Spirit, and he's asked us to develop that. Everything we need to follow. Everything we need to be in obedience to Jesus. Everything we need to be an influence in our world. Through Christ, we've already been given it. Our part is to develop it, exercise it, work it out. So think about this. We've all been given everything we need to be good husbands and good wives. We've been given everything we need to be good citizens, to be good servants. We've been given everything we need to have the ability to forgive, the ability to restore, the ability to go and serve, the ability to overcome our anger, to overcome our fear, to overcome our anxiety, to overcome all the things that hold us back, the bitterness and all the hurt. We've been given everything we need inside of us to be able to do that. Don't get me wrong. We can't do it. We've been given the Holy Spirit. And that. Now, please understand, there's a difference there. I believe once we're saved, 
immediately we get the baptism. The word baptism simply means immersion. We get everything we need from the Holy Spirit. That's what we get at birth, at birth when we get saved. The, the filling of the Holy Spirit's different. That's where the Holy Spirit's in control. That's my choice. Will I allow the Holy Spirit to have his rule and reign? Will I give him that freedom? Or will I say, I want to do it my own way? That's the difference. Now, you know what's unique about growing and developing this is please remember, what you were given is unique to you. Don't try to be someone else. One man said, we're not to be a cheap imitation of other people, even of other great Christians. We are to be followers of Christ and grow in what he has made us to be. You have abilities and gifts that allow you to be effective in a way that I cannot. You've been given abilities to serve at Grace Baptist Church in your community in a way that I cannot. And that's the beauty of how get it, how God did it. He can use your background in a way he can't use mine. He can use even the struggles that you carry with you and say, but my past and my failure, and Jesus says, but I can use that to make you strong and God glorified. It's unique to you. Don't be ashamed by what you've done. Don't be ashamed by who you are. Don't be ashamed by where you think you're falling short because you're not falling short. You're exactly what God desired you to be. And I love what one guy said, God made me and God doesn't make junk. He made you the way he wants you. With your mistakes, with the parts of you you don't like. I joke about this. One of my parts is I'm clumsy and I hate that fact. All right? I just do. The other day, this is how bad it is, all right? This is what I have to live with. The other day, I'm skimming the pool. You know what my family's laughing about? They're waiting for me to fall in. All right? Like, he's got his phone in his pocket. Ha, huh? wait to see what happens there. That's what I heard them laughing about that over there. And here's the problem. They're probably right. At some point, it's going to happen. Why would I keep my phone in my pocket? That makes no sense. Now, what's even worse, we went to Universal in Florida years ago. My son and I, youngest, went down to the pool. We jumped in the lazy river, you know, went around. I'd laid all my stuff down. I get out of that pool. I go into the next pool. And I'm like, this water is so warm. My phone was still in my pocket. And it was burning right next to me. I pulled it out. You could see the steam coming out. And I'm like, and the worst part was day one of vacation. My wife goes, good, no one can call you. That's, see, so that's me. That's, it, it used to bother me. I used to hate it if someone picked at me or laughed at me or whatever. I've got to embrace it. I've got to tell you something. Wade wants me to tell you this, so I will, because this is just how it goes, all right? A couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, Wade, Adam, and I went to the Keen Cafe. Is that what it's called? There's so many things about that day I want to forget, but I can't. They won't let me. So we pull into Keen. I'm riding on this bike. I pull in, you know, the first wheel first. They didn't tell me until after I parked, don't do that, all right? I'm changing that story a little bit, but that's okay. Now, you understand, you've been by Adam and Wave. I'm almost as tall as them, all right? But I'm sitting there. They order omelets. I didn't want a whole lot. I get a short stack of pancakes. They bring me the pancakes with the Mickey Mouse face on the top of it. <laughs> Whipped cream, blueberries, the whole shebang. And as I get home, Wade texts me, they definitely thought you were our kid. That's how I got from it. <laughs> and then as we're leaving, I'm trying to push the bike out. It won't work, so Wade's got to push me out. There's nothing good. You know in that store they're just laughing at me the entire time, right? And I am not going to be allowed to live that down, so I have to own it. I still think Adam went over and made that happen. I still think that. Now, we can get upset and we can say, oh my goodness. Can I tell you, if that's how God's made you, own it and use it for his glory. Amen? It's okay. That's what God has developed you to be, and that's fine. Please understand, we're never going to obtain, we're never going to arrive. Jesus is always developing us. Consider the, the popular idea I've heard on social media a few times. I don't use these a lot, but I thought this was great. One man said, I asked for strength. God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom, and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for courage, and God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked for love, and God gave me people to shower love upon. It doesn't always look the way I thought it would, but he's working. Understand the purpose, number two. Why do we do this? For his good pleasure. Notice the verse states that God works in us. He's the one developing us from the inside out. He's working in us to make us ready for him so that we, that he can work through us. Warren Wearsby stated this, unsaved people complain and find fault. Christians rejoice. Society around us is twisted and distorted. 
But the Christian stands straight because he measures his life by God's word, the perfect standard. The world is dark, but Christians shine as bright lights. The world has nothing to offer, but the Christian holds out the word of life. The message of salvation through faith in Christ. In other words, as we allow God to achieve his purpose in our lives, we become better witnesses in a world that desperately needs Christ. But then he tells us, number three, to understand with patience. He said, do nothing complaining and disturbing. I've got to go find the exact word, but here. I can't find it. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Now, he's talking later about the ability, the ability of what we have, but simply in patience. Allow God to do the work in our life. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be frustrated. Know that whatever he's doing, he can use. Even if it's Satan trying to do it, God can use it for his good. Please remember, these people talk about the battle between Satan and Jesus. Jesus has already won. Amen? Amen. Satan can't do anything. So he's just trying these small things. Jesus can use even his, his attacks for God's glory. Now, I don't always like the process, but I do trust the person of Christ, and that's what I hold on to. So number one, develop what God has given us to display what God has asked of us. Philippians 2.15, he says that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Display. What I'm talking about is a testimony. A couple of things. One, he has asked us to have a strong testimony in our time. He says to show yourself harmless. Please understand, he's not asking us to be perfect. Here's what he's asking, to be sincere, to be genuine. Sincere about what we believe. Sincere about portraying Jesus to the lost. Sincere to show a real person, not a perfect person, but a genuine person. One who's willing to forgive one who's growing. See, our change in growth can be our greatest tool in encouraging, mentorizing, and mentoring, and evangelizing other people. That can be. He's asked us to have a strong testimony in our day. It's interesting, he says, that we're not to be harmful. We're, you know, a good testimony. Think about this. The world has painted church as evil and as hateful and is out of touch. Let our testimony and our actions be such that these accusations are proven wrong. Be such that when somebody in that world meets you, they don't see what the world wants them to believe about us. They see something different. And by the way, I don't mean weird different, okay? I mean someone who just loves the Lord and is filled with the Holy Spirit and is able to show a love to them that the world, even their own people, can't show. That's what he's saying. I'm telling you, one of the things I've seen, this is, it's a simple illustration, but you can build on from here. It bothers me when I see political things and, and these things going on in the world where the world wants us to be angry and Christians go on and they rip and they curse and they say these horrible things. What are they doing? They're hurting. This is what God's told us not to do. We are to be harmless. Now, don't get me wrong. I have a very strong opinion about what's going on in our world. But I have a greater purpose and testimony for Christ. Amen? Amen. Be engaged. Be involved. Volunteer. Serve. But ultimately, when I stand before Jesus, he's going to ask, what did you do with the opportunities you were given? To share Jesus. You see, I'm afraid that if we allow our differences and we allow these petty things to come in, and don't get me wrong, here's what government does. They're making every moral thing a political thing so we can't talk about it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to get political. But the Bible talked about these things way before the government did, right? I don't have to be political. I just go back to the Bible. The truth, we'll see in a little bit. So we're going to stand on those things, but we're going to do it lovingly. And the world screams hate, and and it's full of hate because they're looking for some that will just show that love. Because don't be harmful. Two, he's asked us to be a guide in our times. He says, you are told to shine as lights in a dark world. Remember, Jesus is the light of the world. We're just letting his light shine through us. And as we grow and work out our salvation, our light becomes brighter. Please remember the purpose of light. It gets clarity and direction. Have you ever found yourself, this one to me, I've seen it one time, I think it's hilarious. It happened to me, so I can tell this story. Uh, An old church, I went downstairs. I was new there. I couldn't really find the lights And so I'm walking through there, but I knew there were tables out, 
I knew there were chairs out and probably a weird animal somewhere in there that I didn't want to get caught by, right? So you know what you do when you go into a dark place and there's no light? This is back before cell phones had flashlights, the dark ages. So what do you do? You go down there and you start, you know, this stupid thing, right? And you know whoever, whoever's eyes have already adjusted to the light, you look like an absolute idiot, right? You're over there like this, trying to walk around. The worst part was I'm literally step by step doing this. Someone kicks the light on and there's nothing around me, nothing at all. I look like an absolute idiot. And I looked, he goes, I said, why didn't you turn the light on earlier? He goes, I wanted to see if you'd run into anything. I got a lot of good friends, right? <laughs> as silly as that is, can I use to show how practical it is? That's exactly what the world's doing right now. They're walking around, just trying anything to fill that void that only Jesus can fill. They're looking for answers that only the Bible has, but they've been told to stay away from it. And they're just walking through. They're running into walls. They're tripping over things. They're getting hurt. They're being led in direction by people who claim to know what they're doing to only find themselves in even greater darkness. And if we can look at the world not from the way the government wants us to, but from the way Jesus wants us to, we won't see people different than us. We'll see people lost that need Jesus. Amen? That's the light we can be. And that's what he's asking us to be. And that light attracts people to Jesus. You don't get around a bright light and say, oh my goodness, I don't want to be around that. I shouldn't say that. Right after I got here, Sparky took me to lunch. He's like, I love, I love it when it's cloudy outside. I'm like, what? Who, who doesn't want to be around the sun? Right? Then again, he grew up around the sun all the time. I grew up around clouds. So it was nice. But gen I was just picking on him. But generally, when you are nervous and you're looking for clarity, you look for light. And that's what the world's looking for. Looking for that truth, that light. He's asked us to be that guide. He's asked us three to follow the tr truth in our times. The core of the strength is where we find truth. It's not our truth against theirs. It is just plainly the truth. It is not us against them. It is them seeking the truth, and we have a chance to do it. So while we stand firm, while we are the light, we hold this up. You know what Jesus says? If we will lift him up, he will draw men to him. So we lift up Jesus. We lift him up and let people see that he's got a truth. He's got an answer for the problems today. Then number three, stay dedicated while God uses us. Stay dedicated while God uses us. Philippians chapter 2 verse 17. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Here's what he says, if I'm being poured out, the first thing we see is the joy of being used. Here's what he's saying by being poured out. Literally, he's in prison, he's in the palace, it's not a horrible scenario, but he knows that at least if the Jewish synagogue gets its desire, they're going to get him executed for blasphemy. That's what they want. They say he's stirring up problems and they want him killed. The Romans really didn't know what they were going to do with them. He was a Roman citizen, so that made this whole thing complicated. Either way, Paul knew that there was a chance that he ultimately would die at the end of this. Now, while he ended up did dying for his faith, it was not in this circumstance. He goes, but if I am going to be poured out, he's literally talking about blood on the altar. He goes, if I'm going to die for the cause of Christ, I'm okay. It's a, it, he says it's an offering, a sacrifice for your faith, the joy of being used. In this case, it meant his death. In application, we can see being poured out in a couple of ways. It can mean ultimately that type of death, which in America, we're not that case yet. But you know what it also means? Emptying out what God has given us for his service. So we've been given all these gifts, we've been given all these abilities, we've been given this, this uniqueness that makes us special. And God says, take what makes you you and pour it into other people. Just pour it. Share you. And what you're doing is you're sharing Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the part of you that's not you, the part of you that is uniquely Christian, and you're sharing it with the world. You are pouring that out. You say, but man, sometimes I get used and abused. I call it being useful. Yes, there will be times that sometimes you get used and abused. Sometimes you'll be taken advantage of. I'd rather be taken advantage of and, never, and then never serve, wouldn't you? So that's okay. But you know what? We, if we look at it that way, we'll never want to serve. 
But think about this way. When I pour out, I may pour my life into someone who gets saved. I may pour my life into someone who one day goes to be a preacher or a missionary, a teacher. I may pour my life out into someone who one day could change a major portion of the world that I may never go to as a missionary. And that's what I've been asked to do, pour my life out. That doesn't mean you have to do this full time. Let me give you a thought. All right? we, we are in a multi-generational church. We have people who've been here for more than 10 years. I'll, just be, I'll leave it there, okay? And then people who've been here a little bit less or on the earth than you. All right? Let's just put it politically correct. We have two different generations. For years, and I mean years since I have got got into youth ministry, I would talk to all the different generations about the differences. You know, one of the things I've seen, though, that can hurt a church, if we're not careful, is the older generation saying, we want the young ones to come up, but they have to be a certain way, and and they get frustrated. The younger generation doesn't want to connect with the older. The older generation doesn't want to connect with the younger, and there's this conflict over we do things different, we talk different, we approach things differently, and if Satan is allowed, he will allow that to drive us apart. Here's a thought. Number one, and I will start this way on purpose, younger generation, wouldn't it be great if we could learn from people so we don't make the mistakes they did? I know we don't want to say that, right? Let's go to the second one. Older generation, what if we were less about trying to get people to become like us and just pour what we knew into them? You remember when you were that age? You were just like them. Let them be that way. Let them. Let them discover their walk with God. But take the 30 years of all that God has done in your life and just pour it into them. Love on them. Teach them what you've been given. Help them as they grab the reins of that ministry and allow them to take it to a different level. And that's the premise both ways. The joy is of being used. It's mentoring each other. It's reaching out. It's not always easy, but it is always usable by God. Number th- the second thing it says, the struggles of being used. Along with being used comes trials and persecutions. He says in the passage, He says, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me in that sacrifice because it's a sacrifice worth making. When we give, when we serve, when we come, when we get up early, it's a sacrifice worth making so that we can get that gospel out to a world that is seeking the truth. They're grasping at anything for truth. And as long as the world can make us the bad guy, they won't come. And that's when he says, be harmless. You know, we don't hold truth. He says the whole truth. The Bible tells us in the Proverbs, be wise as serpent and subtle as doves. We are to have the truth. But we have that truth in a way where we can share it. We're not ashamed of it. I hope you understand that. We're not the least bit ashamed of the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen? Never ashamed of it. And if we've got to stand strong on it, we stand strong on it unashamedly. But in a way, as Jesus did, shining that light. As we finish, just two thoughts in closing. Number one, we've mentioned this darkness that the world sometimes finds itself in. Can I ask you this today? Maybe here, maybe you're watching online. Could you say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that if you were to die today or sometime later this week, you'd be in heaven? You have a guarantee of a home in heaven. Some people say you can't know that. First John tells us these things. Have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life? Jesus tells us in Scripture we can have that. You can have that today. Do you know? Please understand, you don't get it through baptism, as great as baptism is. You don't get it from just attending church, as great as that is. You get it when you repent of your sin and turn to Jesus and call upon Him for salvation. Romans 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made and to salvation i am willing to believe that jesus is not a way to heaven he is the only way to heaven and then i'm willing to turn from my sin the word repent simply means turn i turn and i look to jesus and i follow him i wish i could say i stopped sinning unfortunately i don't but i follow him it's a new creation we're told in second corinthians do you have that this morning the hope the light that jesus offers The answer to the questions the world will never be able to answer. Do you have that today? If not, you can have that even in the service this morning. The second question is, are we developing what Jesus has given to us? Now, this one is very broad, right? Because we could talk about every part of sanctification. We could. Right after justification, we go through sanctification. It's that growth process. From the day we're born again to the day we see Jesus. 
God is growing us. It's sanctification. Every day, are we allowing it? Or are we fighting it? Now, here's how you'll know this. It's not something, I could get up here and name 30 things, and I'll forget the 30 things God's doing in your life. Here's where it comes, is the Holy Spirit trying to do something in your life? If he is, are you allowing him to do it? Is he trying to fight your anger? Is he trying to overcome your guilt? Is he trying to help you to move beyond the past? Is he trying to get you to take hold of a ministry or service that makes you a little uncomfortable? Is he trying to get you to take that next step? Is he trying to get you to reconcile in home with your family? Is he trying to get you to reconcile with other people? I could keep going for a long time on this. You know where I'm going with this. He might be doing something in your life. Only you know that. So today, my challenge to you is surrender to what he's doing. Embrace what he's doing. It may be in the form of a trial. It may be in the form of confusion. Because you don't know what he's doing yet. But embrace what God is doing. And when you embrace it, then you'll be able to be guided to see what he's doing to grow you through that. That's what I would challenge us as we close.